welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be looking closely at the case of Melanie Hall, who disappeared from a nightclub in the city of Bath in 1996. It wasn't until 12 years later that Melanie's remains were finally recovered, and it was found that she had been murdered. The time that has elapsed for Melanie's family has caused them untold grief, and sadly, the fact that what happened to her has not been solved has only added to this. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Melanie Hall was born in 1970, in the town of Bradford-on-Avon in Wiltshire in England. The town is popular with tourists due to its historical buildings and picturesque canal. Its proximity to the city of Bath, which is just eight miles away, also makes it a good place for commuters and families to live. Bath is also a very historical city, being known as a spa town during the Georgian era because of its Roman-built baths. The hamlet of Bradford Lee in the town of Bradford-on-Avon is where Pat and Steve Hall lived and grew their family, having two daughters together, Dominique and Melanie. Their life was happy and the Halls enjoyed living in the area, watching as both of their children grew up. Melanie had always had a dream of graduating from university and during the 1990s she attended the University of Bath to study psychology. In 1996 Melanie achieved her dream by graduating from university and her parents were very proud of her for getting what she wanted. She then went on a job search and with her mum's help she got offered a position working as a clerical officer in the orthopaedic ward at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. Pat Hall already worked at the hospital herself. By all accounts she was very happy working in this position and her parents were very close to her during this time as she was still living with them at home. Her mum would later explain that she was planning to get a house of her own in the next six weeks or so and was looking forward to it. Her friends and family described her as happy throughout 1996 and her parents would later say that she was a happy, vibrant young woman with her life ahead of her. Melanie appeared to have other reasons to be happy at this time as well as she had started dating someone new a German-born doctor working at the same hospital, called Dr Philip Karlbaum. They began dating in May 1966 and started to spend increasing amounts of time together. On Friday, June the 8th, Melanie had decided to spend the night at Philip's house and her mum dropped her off there with her overnight bag. That Saturday, they had a lie-in until about 11am and then went shopping in Bristol together. It's known that Melanie bought a new blue dress that day while she was out, which she then wore later that night. That same night, the couple attended a barbecue, which was reportedly very busy, with around 60 people attending. Later that evening, the pair decided to go out with another couple that they were friends with. They made their way to a nightclub on Walcott Street in Bath called Cadillacs. Cadillacs was a popular nightclub in Bath and attracted many people at the weekends. Philip later spoke to BBC's Crime Watch about that evening. He explained that at one point that night he came out of the toilet to see that Melanie was dancing with another man in an intimate fashion. He said that this disappointed him and he decided to go and sit in the car and have a cigarette. He hoped that Melanie might notice he was gone and come out to the car to see him. This didn't happen and after a while he explained he decided to drive home. At around 1.10am, the friends that Melanie and Philip went with to the club decided that they were going home too, and said bye to her, assuming that Philip was still at the club to drive Melanie home. Melanie was last seen by her friends sitting on a stool at the side of the dance floor. It appeared to be like any night out, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary about it. There was, however, an early indication that something may not be right. Melanie did not turn up for a shift at work on Monday, and this was immediately unusual. Melanie was responsible and did not usually forget about coming to work. Melanie's mum stated that she initially thought Melanie had taken the day off, and when she spotted her car in the car park, she decided to put a note on it to tell her to contact her ASAP. 
When she didn't contact her later that evening, her parents were worried. This was out of character for her, and they quickly contacted police to list Melanie as a missing person. Her mum would later state that the note remained on her car for the next few days, and her car stayed in the same position at the hospital. The police were quick to begin the investigation, and realised that Melanie would not have just disappeared. This meant that very soon after she was reported missing, the police began making inquiries with the people that had last seen her and searching the area where she had last been. Philip was reportedly spoken to, and the police tracked down the man that she had been seen dancing with. Neither of these men appeared to raise any red flags, or if they did, this was not published in the press. Philip would later tell newspapers that he was devastated by her disappearance. In the following week, posters were made showing Melanie's picture and describing her last known whereabouts. The detectives made extensive inquiries at the nightclub, trying to track down as many patrons as they could. It's reported in a Telegraph article from the 19th of June 1996 that Avon and Somerset police had asked patrons of the club to fill in questionnaires about their evening, and just over a week later they were processing around a thousand of these. Melanie's family were desperate for any information about their daughter, and agreed with police that her disappearance seemed unusual considering over a week had passed and she had not returned home. Melanie's sister Dominique appealed to the public nine days after her sister had gone missing, stating, If anyone has still not come forward despite the national publicity, please, please ring the police with any ideas. The police knew that Melanie had last been seen at the club and it was their main lead as it seemed as though she had simply vanished after that. It was crucial that they try to discover where she went after this, and possibly who with. One of the lines of inquiry included searching the River Avon, that was only a stone's throw from Walcott Street where Cadillacs was located. This search, however, did not provide any new information, and did not give any clues as to where Melanie may be. After Melanie did not contact her family or friends in the days after, Police began to suspect that something had happened to her and that they may be dealing with foul play. But if this was the case, where had she gone after leaving the club? The police reported in the days and weeks following that they got a very positive response from the public in relation to their appeals and that people had been coming forward with information. The weeks went by and those weeks turned into months with no sign of Melanie at all. This was concerning as she had left all of her belongings behind and did not contact her family during this time. Melanie's family continued to try and reach out for information and in November 1996 the police reached out to the BBC programme Crime Watch to try and gain more leads. A reconstruction of the evening was shown and it revealed some more sightings of Melanie that night along with some worrying information. The programme showed that after her friends had left Cadillacs that morning at 1.10am, there were possibly three more sightings of her. One witness stated that he was stood on the stairs in the club when he noticed a pretty blonde woman sat on a chair talking to a woman. He described the man as being around 5 feet 10 inches tall with a dark complexion. He said he was wearing a brown silk shirt, black trousers, black shoes and was wearing what he described as a flashy watch. The woman had stood out to the man as he described her as pretty and now believed that she looked like Melanie. He then added that a little while later he watched as the couple left the club together. At around 2am there's another possible sighting of Melanie, this time outside the club. Two women who had been at the takeaway on Walcott Street were walking up back towards Cadillacs when they noticed a man and a woman arguing outside the church hall. The women commented that they believed they must be having a lover's tiff and the man was giving the woman a hard time. They later described the man as being around 5 feet 10 and was wearing a black bomber style jacket. The woman was described as having very blonde hair. At a similar time to that sighting, another witness noticed a blonde woman in a light coloured dress being coaxed into a nearby car park by a man. Melanie's mother, Pat, spoke to the programme, explaining that she did not believe Melanie would have done this of her own free will, saying if she was still alive, they would love to just know she was okay, and if she was dead, the family badly wanted to know so that they could bring her home. 
The programme speculated if Melanie's case could have anything to do with the case of Louise Smith in November 1995. The 18-year-old had been on a night out at a club with friends near Bristol when she disappeared. Her body wasn't found until seven weeks later on Christmas Day, despite a huge search effort and investigation. Detective Superintendent Steve Livings told the Crime Watch programme that he did not know if the two cases were connected, but at that time there was no physical evidence to link the cases. There had also been a series of rapes that had happened around the same time in Bath, and Detective Superintendent Livings also would not speculate if these were in some way linked. After a huge push on DNA testing in the area, police would eventually find Louise's killer in 1998. A student, David Frost, was convicted for her murder after he admitted he approached her as she was walking home from the club. He persuaded her to go with him to a nearby quarry where he said they had sex, but Louise got upset and he tried to stop her from crying by putting his hand over her mouth. At this point, he said she went silent and he realised she was dead. He then dragged her body to a more secluded part of the quarry and left her there. In Louise's case, the police had DNA and could match it to people in the area that they had collected DNA from. The problem in Melanie's case was that her body had not been found. She was still missing. Detective Superintendent Livings told Crime Watch that they did want to speak to the man that was seen with someone who looked like Melanie at the time. The descriptions from the witnesses appeared to match someone who was 5 feet 10 inches tall with a tanned complexion. He did state that he doesn't know if this person was with Melanie and that there was no evidence that she had been abducted from the club. He explained that he believed that in that 40 minutes before the club closed, Melanie may well have befriended someone after realising that she was now alone. He said that she could have got a lift with someone outside and he appealed to that person who may well have taken Melanie somewhere that morning. He also stressed that while the eyewitness statements all seem to match Melanie's description, the woman seen may well not be Melanie, and if it isn't, they would like the person described to come forward so that they can be eliminated from their inquiries. There was also another possible piece of evidence shown on the programme. A couple came forward to say that they were walking along the canal heading towards Bradford-upon-Avon a week after Melanie went missing. They explained that they noticed a canal boat as they walked past as a cat ran in front of them and jumped onto it. As they passed the boat, they heard two people talking and heard something to the effect of what happened with Melanie. This seemed important to the couple after they heard about Melanie's disappearance. It was also a quite crucial location as she lived in Bradford-upon-Avon. This information, of course, may not have related to her disappearance as there were many people called Melanie. The Crime Watch reconstruction did prove that witnesses were coming forward with information and after it aired, more tips did come into police. One piece of evidence which was published in the Aberdeen Evening Express in July 1996 suggested that a woman's voice saying, Leave me alone, let me go, was overheard by residents in Walcott Street between 1.15 and 2am. Despite information coming in, the investigation came to somewhat of a standstill, with Melanie sadly still missing. Her family continued to appeal for information and it's reported that on the one year anniversary of her disappearance, Pat and Mike once again appealed to the public and visited Cadillacs to speak to people there. In 1998 it's reported in the Aberdeen Press and Journal that detectives had been speaking to John Canaan in relation to Melanie's disappearance. Canaan had been convicted in 1989 of the 1987 murder of Shirley Banks in Bristol along with an attempted kidnapping and rape of another two women. While not a suspect in Melanie's disappearance as he was in prison during that time, police were interested in his former cellmate, Christopher Clark, who had been imprisoned for rape. He had been interviewed by police just a month before being arrested for the other offence. It's reported that the two men may have discussed how to commit the perfect abduction. Kanan later became the only suspect in the 1986 disappearance of estate agent Susie Lamplew, who disappeared after attending a house viewing with a client who called himself Mr Kipper. It was later found that this was a false name after the name drew a blank. 
The investigators continued to follow all lines of inquiry. However, sadly, the years went by without any success and no new discoveries led to Melanie's whereabouts. Hundreds of people were interviewed and a reward of £10,000 was published for any new information. In 2000, it's reported that another man named Mark Shalibia was questioned in relation to Melanie's disappearance. He had been convicted of the murder of Rebecca Storrs in Bristol in 1999. Rebecca attended a house party after a night out where she met Shalibia. She was later found by a dog walker and Shalibia was convicted on DNA evidence collected from the scene and from his car. He came to the police's attention in Melanie's case after they were told that he had confessed to a cellmate that he had been involved with Melanie's disappearance. Shalibia rejected this claim and refused to cooperate with the police. He also appealed the decision made in his conviction for Rebecca's murder. However, this was deemed safe by the Court of Appeal in 2006. As Shalibia refused to cooperate and there was no other evidence, the police could go no further with this line of inquiry. A few years later in 2003, news came that two men in their 30s had been arrested in Bath in relation to Melanie's case. It's reported in the Gazette and Herald that farmland in the hamlet of Inglesbatch was also searched after new evidence was reportedly discovered. The land was used as a pig farm and it was reported in the Guardian that officers spent two weeks searching pig waste, however did not find anything relevant. Despite this new evidence coming to light, the two men were eventually released without charge. This was sadly another setback for the case as Melanie was still a missing person. In 2004, an inquest was ordered into Melanie's disappearance. The police were now sure that something must have happened to her as she had made no contact with anyone for eight years. As there was no evidence to suggest what did happen, an inquest was needed to look at her case. An open verdict was ruled with the coroner, Paul Forrest, suggesting that Melanie had been unlawfully killed, but there was a lack of evidence. The open verdict once again left many questions in this already mysterious case. Melanie was declared legally dead that year. Despite the many lines of inquiry and the large-scale investigation that was conducted, Melanie's family and friends still did not have closure. They seemed no closer to finding out what had happened to her. How could she just vanish without any trace? It's reported in The Guardian that Steve Hall stated at the time, I think she went off with someone and something went terribly wrong. We need to find Melanie so that we can have some kind of service or burial and be able to draw the line. In 2009, a huge discovery would change how the case was approached and unfortunately confirm everyone's worst fears. On the 5th of October, a workman was cutting grass next to the Junction 14 northbound slip road of the M5 motorway. This area was close to the town of Thornbury, around 30 miles from Bath. As he was cutting the grass, he noticed a plastic bin bag tied at the top with some blue rope. When he looked inside the bag, he discovered bones that appeared to be human. After alerting the authorities, the area was cordoned off and a forensic investigation began. It would later be discovered that the bones were indeed human and included a skull and a pelvis. It's reported by the BBC that after a search of the area, other human remains had also been found partially buried in the undergrowth. It was clear that the police were dealing with a murder, and they immediately began making connections with cases in the area. Melanie's disappearance was of course quickly thought about. As well as the bones, jewellery had been found buried in the area, and this was an important part of the identification process. When this jewellery was shown to Melanie's parents, it's reported that they confirmed that it did belong to her. It wasn't until DNA confirmed it, however, that the remains were officially declared as Melanie's. She had finally been found, however the circumstances in which she was discovered were not what anyone had hoped for. The location of her body was immediately a strange part of the investigation. A motorway slip road was not necessarily an ideal place to try and bury a body due to its proximity to other people who were driving past. Detective Chief Inspector James Riccio, who was placed in charge of the investigation, told Bristol Live, 
We believe the choice of deposition site is key. Whoever left Melanie's body in the undergrowth off the northbound slip road of Junction 14 of the M5 would have done so in haste. It would have happened on the morning of June the 9th, 1996, or within a few days of this date. It's likely this person would have then driven onto the northbound M5 and either onto the next junction, or they may have turned off at the Michael Wood services, where they could have used the local road network, including a slip road behind the services, to head back in the southerly direction. We believe it's highly likely that the person who left Melanie's body at this location was familiar with the area. The person who deposited the body may not be the person who killed Melanie. If this is the case, I'm directly appealing for this person to come forward and provide us with information for the sake of Melanie's family. You've been living with a dark secret for years, but your guilt and fear is nothing compared to the enduring pain felt by Melanie's family. I want to be clear, our primary focus is on identifying the person or persons who killed Melanie. A small or seemingly insignificant piece of information could be key to solving this case. Steve Hall, Melanie's father, also spoke to the press in agreement with the police's statement, saying, I do think it was odd that Melanie's body was dumped on the side of an access road to a motorway. It didn't seem to be a very calculated act. It didn't seem a very planned act, and I think it smacked of panic. On that night, there were only two and a half to three hours of darkness, and it may have been that someone was caught by the breaking dawn and acted rather irrationally. It certainly was an odd place to find her. The investigators did discover some important evidence at the scene. The rope was of particular interest. It was made up of four pieces of blue polypropylene rope that had been tied together and had seven knots in it in total. The rope was commercially manufactured and was commonly used on building sites and also for drawing electrical cable through trunking. What wasn't found at the scene was also of interest to the investigators. There was no sign of any of her belongings, including her clothes. It's reported that there were a number of her possessions that were missing, including the pale blue dress, cream-coloured jacket, black suede shoes and her black handbag that she had been wearing that night. These were not recovered, along with her cosmetics, checkbook and bank card. It was also pointed out that some of her jewellery was also missing an expanding bracelet from the shop next, and some silver drop earrings. Melanie's discovery was both a huge relief and a source of continued agony for her parents and family. In the days after Melanie's discovery, the police announced that they had found a set of Ford car keys close to her body. There were two black ignition keys and one red key which was said to be a programming key. There was also a tag attached to the keys which had a code on it. It read T144213. The police were unsure if these keys were in any way related to Melanie's murder, but they did state, we really need to know what vehicle these keys relate to and what connection there is to Melanie. They also released some information about injuries that Melanie had. They stated that there was evidence that she had been the victim of blunt force trauma to the head, as she had amongst other injuries, a fractured skull, a fractured cheekbone and jawbone. Her post-mortem later indicated that she died from the severe head injuries that she had suffered. It was clear that Melanie's murder had been a violent one, and the police began actively pursuing lines of inquiry. Melanie's parents took part in a press conference after the discovery of their daughter's body, expressing that while they were relieved that some of her remains had been found, they were angry that she had just been dumped by the side of the road like a sack of garbage. This was a sentiment shared by the police who were appalled by the fact that she had been left there for 13 years before being discovered. Melanie's father urged the perpetrator or anyone that knew about the murder to have the moral fibre to come forward to tell the police what they knew. Her parents also said they had several questions that needed answering after finding out where Melanie was. Steve Hall told the BBC, Who was involved in what was now her murder and why? What were the circumstances that led to her murder? These were questions that the police intended to try and find out while her family finally put Melanie to rest at the end of October 2009. The funeral was attended by her family, police officers and well-wishers. 
there was a relief that Melanie could finally be buried and that she had eventually been found, but her killer still remained at large. Throughout 2010, the police continued to follow up on leads and questioned further suspects. It's reported in a BBC article that the police took another 250 statements and 1,200 new tasks and investigative actions had been completed. Arrests also took place during 2010 in relation to her murder. Two arrests were made, a 38-year-old man and a 39-year-old man were arrested but were subsequently released without charge. At the end of 2010, the police revealed that they had a tip about the origin of the blue rope used to tie up the bin bags that Melanie had been found in. They also stated that they had found a car which could be connected to the case. The car was a white Volkswagen Golf GTI Cabriolet, and the police said that it was being examined by forensic scientists. They did state that they didn't know at the time if it was connected to the crime, however were sure it was a possible line of inquiry. The next few years went by with the police continued to investigate lines of inquiry related to Melanie's murder, however it was in 2016 that new evidence came to light. The police announced that they had retrieved DNA from one of the items recovered from the scene where her body had been found. This was very good progress in terms of the investigation, and meant that scientists could now work on gaining a DNA profile of the suspect. Detective Superintendent Andy Bevan told the Express newspaper about the find. He said, For the first time I am able to confirm publicly that we do have DNA evidence which was left on an item, found at the scene where Melanie's remains were discovered. Through new techniques, we're in the process of developing a DNA profile. There's no doubt this brings us an important step closer to finding her killer. He also added, We don't have a prime suspect, and we don't have any conclusive evidence to suggest Melanie's death is linked to any other murders, or sexual offences committed in our force area, or elsewhere in the country. There are, however, numerous people of interest in this investigation, and we're looking into whether they have a potential link to this horrific crime. I believe the DNA profile will assist these inquiries significantly. Melanie's case was once again featured on Crime Watch on the Crime Watch Roadshow programme in 2016, following the DNA discovery. Detective Superintendent Andy Bevan explained that they had recovered new DNA evidence and also showed some footage from Cadillac's nightclub in the hope that it jogged someone's memory. He also explained that the night that Melanie went missing may be significant in someone's memory, as it was the start of the Euro 96 football championship and England was hosting it. That night they played Switzerland and they drew 1-1. It was hoped that this would help someone remember what they were doing or where they were that day. Similar clothing to those that Melanie was wearing that night was also shown. Detective Superintendent Andy Bevan appealed for the public to come forward, explaining that the person or persons responsible for Melanie's murder may not look suspicious, they may just be a member of the community, who does not attract much attention, and therefore any information is valuable. Following on from the announcement that DNA had been found, Melanie's parents announced that they were putting up a £50,000 reward for anyone with information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible. This ran alongside the £10,000 reward that had been put up by Crime Stoppers. 2016 marked 20 years since Melanie had initially gone missing, and it was hoped that this new DNA evidence may well lead to the apprehension of her killer. The investigation is continually ongoing, however so far no suspect has been named by police. In 2019, investigators once again reached out to the public for anyone to come forward who may have information, stressing that DNA testing was still ongoing to try and link it to any suspects. They asked the public to come forward if they had been in the area at the time, possibly saw Melanie that night, were in Cadillacs, saw any suspicious activity in the area of the M5 slip road, or knew anything about Melanie's missing belongings, such as her clothes and handbag. They also appealed for information about friends or family members who may have started acting differently around the time that she went missing. The police stated that even one phone call could help to solve the case. The public had responded to all of the appeals with new information coming in each time they reached out. 
However, this information had not yet solved what had happened to Melanie. Her parents have campaigned continually for justice for their daughter and have never given up on finding out what happened to her. In 2019, Melanie's father released a statement on behalf of the family. He said, It's now over 23 years since our youngest daughter Melanie was murdered, probably on the streets of Bath. Since that time, the Avon and Somerset police have poured endless resources in their attempt to find her killer. Sadly as yet, this objective remains unfulfilled, although I and my family remain eternally optimistic that eventually they will be successful. This is a tale of two families who, although possibly living quite close to each other, are worlds apart. Sadly, in the summer of 1996, the paths of these two families crossed. In one home resides a fairly ordinary family whose members, although not perfect, strive to work hard, respect their fellow citizens and uphold the law. In the other home there lives a very different family, separated from the rest of society, a family governed by a very different code of conduct and one that lacks the moral fibre that binds the majority of our human race together. Within that family is the person who murdered our daughter Melanie and who probably still resides in or near the city of Bath, surrounded by his or her version of their family and friends. In our family we will forever grieve for and miss our lovely daughter, a young woman whose life stretched before her until that fateful night in June 1996, when that life was so cruelly snatched from her. She will never fulfil her life's ambitions, never marry, never have children, and my wife and I will never have another grandchild. Her mother's lasting memory of her youngest daughter is the day she viewed a battered skull and a few broken bones in the coroner's office at Portishead. We have little hope that Melanie's murderer will ever be caught as a result of information from a member of the public. The lives of the person responsible and those others who know what happened that night are governed by a totally different set of rules and moral responsibilities from the rest of us. We are sure that after all these years they will happily take their awful secret to the grave as we will do the same with our grief. I take stock. A daughter who is dead, a wife who just stares at the wall, a sister who struggles to get her day together, a 100-year-old grandmother who sits in a home with soft memories, and a father who puts it all in a box and tries to shut the lid, so we can all carry on. I have no concern for that person who lives in the other family a family with which I cannot identify and whose lifestyle is beyond my comprehension. Like the beasts in the field that devour each other, he or she probably thinks that their actions that night and their lifestyle are completely justified. For the sake of all those in the Avon and Somerset police, I hope they are successful in bringing someone to justice, for they have really put up a maximum effort to find Melanie's killer. Unfortunately, should they be successful, this will not bring closure, as only the return of Melanie alive will achieve that, and that's gone forever. I am often asked what, if Melanie's killer were brought to justice, I would like to see happen to them. Quite simply, nothing that the judiciary system can do will bring Melanie back, and my real thoughts towards her killer are totally unprintable. I think this statement is so poignant and sums up exactly how many people feel about Melanie's case. It's so tragic that she was taken away from her family unnecessarily and that she never got to do the things that she'd planned. Despite the thorough investigation conducted by Avon and Somerset police, her killer has still not been discovered. So what happened to Melanie that night? It's clear that something happened to her after she left the club in the early hours and there is evidence to suggest she may have been speaking to someone and may have even left with them. Was this person responsible for her murder? Had something gone wrong after she left this person? Or did something happen to her on the way home? Eyewitness testimony appears to suggest that she was not alone when she left, however this cannot always be relied upon. I agree that the location of her body does imply that whoever had committed the crime had a limited amount of time to dispose of her remains, and that was the reason why they were left there. Where, though, are her belongings? Were they disposed of elsewhere at another time? Melanie's case caught the attention of the public and has been speculated upon for years. Her family are hopeful that they will get justice for their daughter and I really hope that they do. 
Melanie deserves justice for what happened to her. If you have any information about the murder of Melanie Hall, you can contact Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 111 or you can call the Operation Denmark Incident Room at 01278 648 934. You can also give information online via the Major Incident Public Portal. I will leave the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I would love to hear your thoughts on this case, so let me know on social media. Thank you as always to our Patreon supporters. I appreciate all the support you give the podcast. If you would like to support us over there to get stickers, shoutouts, bonus episodes and ad-free early access episodes, the link is in the show notes. You can also help by reviewing the podcast wherever you listen or by subscribing to our YouTube channel where I upload the audio from the episodes. If you want to contact me, you can by following the podcast on social media, on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, or if you have any suggestions for future episodes or any other inquiries, please email me at theunseenpod at gmail.com. Keep listening at the end today for a promo from a fab UK true crime podcast called Murder and More, hosted by Kira. I know many of you enjoy listening to UK true crime, so we'll love this. As always, stay safe. I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Hi guys, Kira from Murder and More here. I am the solo host of the UK-based true crime podcast, where each Sunday I tell you about a murder, disappearance or serial killer. Murder and More is available to listen to wherever you get your podcasts, including platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Castbox and Stitcher. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and on Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. Head over to murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com to find out more.